What emerged from English paintings is a sense of solitude of blacks in the alien environment of the aristocratic household. White servants were the norm, but did not signify their master's wealth, whereas having a black servant showed you had quite a high social status. Black servants carried out numerous chores upon which the smooth running of the household and its inhabitants. Page boys accompanied the lady of the house wherever she went. Footmen carried messages for their employers. Some went overseas and went ahead to book accommodation for their employers. Older servants might be promoted to valets, butlers, grooms and coachmen. Matilda Hampshire was one of my best friends. The last time I saw her before she died was when she was with her owner, two days before. She looked scared, which wasn't normal for her. She was always strong and confident, and her owner looked like he was rising his hand on her, then stopped. He saw me. I wish I could tell you I ran as fast as I could, but he ordered one of his slaves to catch me, which they did. They grabbed me by the arm and brought me out of the tree shadows. He just stared at me. He looked just as scared as Matilla. I didn't even know him before. Matilla just stared, started crying and telling him how I would keep quiet. I didn't know why or what about. It couldn't be about him raising his hand because I know other people had done worse to their slaves. He just told me not to tell a soul or just forget about everything that happened. Then he let me go. I couldn't process anything through my mind at that point. I just ran to nowhere. I never saw her after that. I only had one question, and I still have it. It doesn't make sense to me why people don't think about other deaths that you know how they die, and you know why they died. But it's not true. I think you only want to know about my story because you don't know anything about other deaths, because no one wants to know, which could be why no one knows how she died why there are six black pallbearers who her owner was, why no one takes notice of other people that were there at the funeral. All I can say is people might be talking about the wrong thing. They shouldn't be talking about the pallbearers. Maybe they should start talking about the other several that hasn't been mentioned as much. Maybe someone wanted to hide something, so they used the six black pallbearers as a distraction. My question is, why, out of all the other slaves' deaths, would you want to know about this one? All I want to say is don't forget there were several others of the same complexion that attended the corpse as mourners, and to look at different dates before or after her death. She died on Wednesday, 10th of February, 1755, Walcott Church. Ignatius Sancho, born in 1729, 14th of December, 1780. He was a composer, actor, writer, and most famously a slavery abolitionist. He was the first registered Black Briton of African origin to vote in parliamentary election. He gained fame in his time as the extraordinary Negro. Being born on a slave ship was very difficult and at the young age of two was transported to Britain. This is where he spent the rest of his life, and he taught himself to read and write. This was inevitable, as his father committed suicide rather than live as a slave, and his mother died in the Spanish colony of New Granada. He previously worked for the three maiden sisters from 1731 to 1749. They were extremely impressed by his intellect, amiability, and frankness. They often lent him books from the library. His informal education was of such a high standard that it made his lack of freedom unbearable. In 1768, Sancho travelled to the circus in Bath, along with the Duchess of Montagu. Sancho was offered a sitting so that Thomas Gainsborough could paint a portrait of Ignatius. Twelve years after this portrait was painted, Sancho passed away. As he was famed for his letters, the 160 plus that he wrote were turned into two volumes of Sancho's late letters. Before he passed, he married a West Indian woman named Anne. When Sancho passed away, his wife received an annuity exceeding £300. 
In my opinion, Sancho was very effective in the sense that you don't have to be perfect to make a difference. For example, he was a prolific gambler, and at one time he lost his clothes. However, the 160 plus letters he wrote was a large step in the process of the abolition of slavery, which was a grand contribution. Born on a slave ship in 1729, taught himself to read and write, and he was pretty fine. With his friends Samuel Johnson and Lawrence Stern he dined. He was a black African with a very intelligent mind. He was brought to England when he was only two. He was the first recorded African who voted in a parliamentary election, but that's not all he could do. He published letters in an anti-slavery campaign. He wrote himself into fame. And that's the story of Ignatius Sancho. George Palgrim Bridgetower was a violinist, a pupil and companion of Beethoven. In 1789, at the age of 10, he gave a concert at the assembly rooms. They said, Those who had the pleasure were encaptured with the astonishing abilities of this wonderful child. Mr. Steal Your Girl, Where's the Bro Code, Pals Before Gals, Removed from the Symphony Only Due to Jealousy. For sale, a Negro boy about 13 years old, quite black, perfectly well made and found. He has a good capacity, been nearly two years in England in a family where he has done the business of a footboy, can wait at a table extremely well and has an ear for music. For Father Peculiars, inquire of Mr Williams Bridgen, coachmaker in Bath. Sold at 13. I was once a fine looking lad until I disobeyed my dad, but I really meant my master and I was trying to work harder. I think he disliked me and he wanted to fight me. Then he got mad and said he was sad and wanted to tell me that he wanted to sell me. He put up posters and wanted boasters to tell the people he wanted to sell me that had skin that was quite black. Quite black? How could you say that? What if I said quite white? Would you like? Or quite pink? What would you think? Has an ear to music? Well, isn't that nice? But labelled as a footboy because he's not white. I am interested in the contrast between the value of these two boys' lives. One is being praised as a genius, while the other is being sold as an object. This is the will of Thomas Prince, a wealthy landowner who lived in Wickham Crescent, Bath. He used to own two plantations in Jamaica, Norwich Plantation and Terra Nova Plantation. He left in his will that his plantations were to be sold to James Colthurst, and all the profit was to be divided between his sons and daughters. However, he had a black servant who took on the name Thomas Prince and was left with a £5 pension and was allowed to keep the name. We don't know what happened to the servant. Why was he left with such a large pension, considering what position he held? Or why he was even left a pension? We don't know whether he went back into employment, or he may have started his own family, and been a free man, and started his own business, and invested, and earned his own money. We don't know whether he's left his own will, we don't know where he's buried or anything. And between the two, we know far more, and there are far more records of the wealthy landowner who ran plantations in Jamaica, and we know nothing of the servant that was Thomas Prince.
Black female servants, apart from ladies' maids, worked out of sight and it's difficult to find information about them. Mulatto mistress maids were in fashion. Income sources consisted of tips from guests. The other perks were, for example, hand-me-down clothes. Many black people started their lives as servants, however, so did the majority of white people until the end of the First World War. The term servant had a wider meaning in Georgian times. The word employee would be a close equivalent. In 1804, a servant boy by the name of Jack drowned in the River Avon. His body was found in Seymour Street. There were only two witnesses. The first one was called Henry Siddons, who at the time was a blacksmith. What happened was Henry Siddons was in Kingsmead Fields and he saw Jack getting in for a swim. He was a great swimmer. He swam all the way across the river, but it was when he came back he got into trouble. He took a dive and came back up. The second time he dived in and came back up, but the third time he dived in, but Jack didn't come back up. Henry Siddons was really worried he ran to get help from a fisherman by the name of James Roberts to take his boat and go look for him. They found Jack with a crook over his body, but it was too late. He was dead when they found him. Fed up of being a slave? Well, you're in luck with this first instalment of a dummy's guide to escaping slavery. First step. Come up with a foolproof plan. I would recommend disguising as a slave owner and slash or a slave. Step two, make sure you have good transport links. Without them, you won't be able to go nowhere. Third step, wear good clothes. Imagine you're going to a fancy dress party. Fourth step, timing is the key. You need to have a good route to ensure you get to your destination quickly and not raise any suspicion. Step five, if you're illiterate, Fake medical injuries may be required. Top tip, travelling during night would be the better approach for keeping your escape low profile. Step 6, determination leads to success. It may be challenging, but the outcome is worth it. We recommend staying in the beautiful city of Bath if looking for further safety. And if all else fails, we do not take any responsibility for being captured and tortured. Mm -hmm.